Hey everybody, it's Rob from Reason Prep. Today I wanted to take a look at something from the first administered real new PSAT from the reading section. It's something that when I've gone through PSATs, the particular October PSAT with students recently, this has just come up again and again and again, so I thought it would be useful for me to release a video about it. And it's about the Frederick Douglass passage from the reading section. This one just gave students a lot of trouble because this is the what they call the founding documents or the great global conversation passage. There's always gonna be one passage from history and often it's gonna have archaic language, old fashioned kind of language that's sometimes hard to parse. So what I wanna do is go through this passage paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence and break it down so you can see what's going on here. Now in this video, I'm not actually gonna go through any of the particular questions from the PSAT. If you have questions about any of those and you want me to talk about them, I can. I'll make a separate video or maybe a separate little mini course about that section, that particular passage. But I just wanna go through this paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence. So the first thing I want you to do is just read it on your own first. If you click the link in the description below, you'll go to my website, you'll see this text. Read this on your own and then come back and we'll talk about it. So now that you've read the text, let's go through this sentence by sentence. And what I wanna do is just show you, uh, obviously on the PSAT, you're not gonna have the time to go through this in the type of detail we're gonna be going through uh, this particular passage. You just don't have the time and your focus should be on answering questions. But I do wanna show you what we can extract, what meaning we can extract as we break this down, as we break this passage down sentence by sentence, as we paraphrase it and summarize it so that we kind of figure out what Douglas's point is. So feel free to follow along in your text, maybe jot down some notes, or you can just watch and listen to uh, how I break this down. The first thing we need to do actually is read the blurb. Now that's not on here, this is from the PSAT. So let me read the little blurb that you would get at the beginning of the passage just to get the context. So it says, the following passage is adapted from Frederick Douglass, what to the slave is the 4th of July? So that's the speech title. Originally del delivered on July 5th, 1852, Douglas, a noted abolitionist and author, was a former slave. He gave the speech to an anti-slavery group in Rochester, New York. So there's our context. He's giving a speech, well, the day after the 4th of July, but it's about the 4th of July holiday, uh, the holiday where America got its independence or celebrates when America got its independence. And he's giving the speech to an anti-slavery group. So let's go ahead, let's read through this and break it down and see what's going on here. I will actually reference some of the questions as we go through this, but like I said, I'm not gonna go through the questions in detail unless you want me to. So let's start. Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? So in this first sentence, we really get the opening of what this paragraph is trying to do. In the sentence, he's asking, basically, oh, oh uh, he's greeting the audience and saying, well, why am I here? Why was I called to speak today? Why am I here? Why am I up here giving a speech? Right? He's kind of laying that question out uh, to almost like it's a rhetorical introduction to say, well, let's let's talk about why I'm here. Um, this language actually ended up being part of a question, right? He's, I wouldn't say he's feigning politeness, but he is pouring on the politeness as a kind of rhetorical effect because by the end of this excerpt, he's gonna be kind of the opposite of polite. So he's starting out very polite, opening up the conversation. What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? So basically asking, what do I, those I represent, in other words, slaves and ex-slaves, uh, to do with your national independence? So how, if I'm here giving a speech on Independence Day, why? What do I have to do with this holiday? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? So are we too the beneficiaries of the, not of the uh, rights and freedoms granted by the Declaration of Independence? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? So he's using religious imagery here, which he does all throughout the, throughout the speech. So basically saying, you know, am I here to talk about how great the declar uh, how great the 4th of July is, how awesome it is for my people, right? Slaves and ex-slaves. Um, uh, former slaves like he is. Am I here to talk about how great the Declaration of Independence is for us? Like, is that why I'm here? So this whole opening paragraph is talking about, you know, he's basically saying, why am I here? Am I here to talk about how great the 4th of July is? Am I here to talk about how this is something that you know, we all get these freedoms from the 4th of July? It's so great. 
Well, as we're going to see, no, he's going to follow this up by basically saying, no, that's not why I'm here. I'm here for an entirely different reason. But he's in this first paragraph, he's asking these series of questions to set the expectation or to begin to ask the question about why he's here. And this is going to lead into eventually his argument about how it's kind of ironic that he's here, given that he, as a ex-slave, former slave, somebody who, um, uh, even though he was, is no longer a slave, still doesn't have many rights, it's kind of ironic that nonetheless he's here giving a speech about the Declaration of Independence, and that's where it's going. So, second paragraph. Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. This first bit here gave students a lot of trouble. Would to God. It's an archaic expression. Basically, it means uh, if only or if we could only hope or we could only wish, basically. It's basically saying, you know, if only for our sakes and for your sakes, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. In other words, he's saying affirmative answer means saying yes. He's basically saying in the sentence, if only I could say yes to all those following questions. So remember these questions were, you know, am I here to talk about how great the Declaration of Independence is for us? Am I going to be the representative to talk to kind of talk about the blessings that we've gotten from this independence? And his response immediately is, well, if only I could say yes, implying that he's going to say the opposite. Then would my task be light? and my burden easy and delightful. Like if I could say yes to these questions, this would be an easy speech to give. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? So again, we follow up with these kind of rhetorical questions. This first question he says, for who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? In other words, who out there could be so cold, and as we'll see, who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge his priceless benefits? Like if we were the beneficiary of these amazing blessings and the independence uh, represented by the 4th of July. If we were, who could be so ungrateful as to not talk about how great these things are? So he's immediately pushing out of the way the idea that, oh, well, maybe he's not going to talk about how great the Declaration of Independence is because he's an ungrateful person. Well, he's saying out, no, it's not that I'm ungrateful. Right? It's not that I have all these great blessings and I'm so cold and ungr ungrateful that I'm not going to be thankful about it. He's going to go on to say, no, I just I don't have these blessings or these this independence at all. That's the problem. Uh, continues on, who's so stolen and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude have been torn from his limbs? In other words, I'm an ex-slave. You know, if things were so great, of course I would talk about how great the country is and how great the Declaration of Independence is for us. This is a question, uh, a sentence that a question was talking about. I am not that man. Here he's basically saying, I am not an ungrateful person. I am not somebody who would reject the blessings of my country if indeed I could enjoy the blessings of my country. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap as a heart. If you look this in the original text in the PSAT had a footnote and a heart is a kind of deer, I believe. Uh, in fact, I think I put it here. No, I didn't put it here. So yeah, a, a heart is a type of deer. So this is kind of a throwaway line. He's basically saying uh, if the, the dumb might eloquently speak, dumb here is an old school expression for basically the mute, someone who can't speak, and the lame man leap as a heart. So in other words, lame here meaning like crippled, uh, disabled. So basically what he's saying, like if I were to be ungrateful, that would be so contrary to my nature, it would be as if a dumb person were speaking eloquently or a lame man were bounding around like a deer, right? Was agile and moving around even though he was disabled. So it's kind of a throwaway line, basically saying, I am not an ungrateful person. If I were, I would be talking about how great things are, but things aren't great as we'll go into. So next paragraph, and this is where we get into it. But such is not the state of the case. And I want to draw your attention to this word, but. This is that a word of contrast. It's like a word like however or not or on the contrary or on the other hand or nevertheless. These words of contrast show you that we have an important part of the passage. And here it's but such is not the state of the case. So he's saying no. Everything I've said above is just not how it is. I'm not he going to be here talking about how great the Declaration of Independence is. It's not that I'm ungrateful. It's that, as we'll discuss, I don't have these benefits. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. In other words, there's a gap between our experiences, between our liberties, between what we enjoy from something like the Declaration of Independence. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. In other words, I really can't celebrate this. I'm not part of this celebration. 
Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. Again, echoing that idea of disparity. Your independence, your holiday, only in uh, when you juxtapose that to my situation, only makes the difference between us even more stark because you're independent, you're enjoying this holiday. Me and my people, we are not. The, blessing, the blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. By in common, they mean you know everybody having this, everybody sharing in it. So again, not everybody has the blessings that you're celebrating in this day. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. So again, all these things that you got from your forefathers, right, 1776, probably at the time of this, 1852, their grandparents or something like that, great-grandparents maybe, you know, all of those things you got, I don't have. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. So in other words, the great benefits of the 4th of July, which are great for you, have brought the opposite to me. Not just not just I don't have the benefits, I've had the opposite, right? Your 4th of July, your Declaration of Independence has in some ways led to my slavery, or at least the founding of your country has led to my enslavement, my enslavement and the uh, enslavement of my people. Uh, uh, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. To drag a man in fetters, fetters basically mean like handcuffs or chains, into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems or inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. So in other words, it's it's kind of makes a mockery of your independence of your holiday to bring a person like me in here to talk about independence. It's like, I'm not a slave, but he was a slave and he definitely doesn't have equal rights at the time that he's speaking. So he's saying, it's kind of ridiculous that you're bringing me of all people in here to talk about how to talk about the 4th of July, given my situation. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak today? So are you trying to like, are you, am I a, a game for you? Am I a clown for you? Are you trying to make fun of me here? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes, towering up to heaven, were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying that nation in irrecoverable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of appealed and woe-smitten people. So this is a this whole bit is a biblical reference, which you don't really need to understand. I think it's talking about the Tower of Babel, I'm guessing. I don't quite know. I'm not exactly an expert on this. That's my guess. Uh, I think the point that I get from this is it's kind of saying you don't be too arrogant. You know, if you're mocking me, don't be so arrogant and think you have everything all fit together because God has thrown down arrogant countries and arrogant nations before. Something like that. It's a warning to them. Uh, and he's going to, as he says, take up the plaintive lament of appeal and smitten people. In other words, he's going to talk about uh, the injustices on his own people. What follows now is a quote, and this was also something that had a footnote. This is this quote is from Psalm 137, and it describes the experiences of Jewish exiles in the city of Babylon. So, again, kind of, no, they're not slaves, but they're definitely, at the time, the Jews were uh, second-class citizens in this time. So he's, again, quoting the Bible, quoting their experiences, and making a link, right, between the biblical experiences and the experiences of blacks in America to show that, that link. So, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we swept, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they who wasted us required a, of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. So, we can break this down, but again, this is not so important. A lot of being able to handle this passage, these passages is knowing what's important and what's not. They don't really ask any questions on this. Basically, he's drawing a bunch of parallels between the situation of the Jews in Babylon and the situation of uh, blacks in America at the time, and particularly this kind of middle bit of, you know, they're saying, to, they're saying to the Jews, sing us one of the songs of Zion, almost in a mocking way, just like he referred before, like, are you mocking me to come here and talk on this day? So he's just drawing these parallels. It's not super important. Um, let's continue on to the next. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions. 
whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday are today, rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. So in other words, you're having this celebration and it's making the people who are in chains making their experience even worse because they are in some sense being mocked or they're seeing the celebration and this hypocrisy and it makes their burden even worse. Uh, if I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. That goes back to referencing the earlier bit where they say, if I forget Jerusalem, right, if they forget their homeland, may these bad things happen to me. He's basically saying the same thing. If I forgot my people on this day who are suffering, these bad things should happen to me. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. So uh, this is a bit confusing. It's, he's not saying that the slaves and uh, African Americans have done wrong. It's not their wrongs in the sense that they've done bad things. When he says pass lightly over their wrongs, he means the wrongs being done to them, the injustices being done to them. And he's saying here to kind of whitewash or ignore the bad things that are happening to my people uh, on this day and to chime in with the popular theme. In other words, to kind of talk about how great the 4th of July is and not really get into the details of it would be treason. He would, uh, it would make him reproach before God. In other words, he would be, be an awful, awful thing. He'd be betraying his people. He'd be betraying God, etc. Um my subject, then fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. So he's going to be talking about American slavery. He's going to be taking the point of view of a slave when he makes the speech. Standing there, identified with the American bondman. This also had a footnote, and I believe this is just a, an adult male slave. Making his wrongs mine. Again, it's not that the slave has done something wrong. It's the wrongs being done to the slaves, and he's going to... Uh, put them on himself. He's going to speak about them. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. So in other words, to sum things up pretty strongly, um, he basically says that the character and conduct of the nation never looked blacker. In other words, never looked more evil or hypocritical or wrong than it does on the 4th of July, right? So he's not going to talk about how great the country is. He's going to be taking the perspective of the American slave who does not see the glories of the country that white people, for example, would see during this time. So long story short, that is this, the analysis of the passage. At this point, if you go to any of the questions, I think the questions will make a lot more sense, particularly the one about what these opening questions are about, uh, the one about, uh, I think there was a question involving the word disparity. Uh, there were some questions about uh, as we said before, the I am not that man quote, some more general questions. So I think at this point, you should be ready to really handle any question. Again, this, you can't go in this detail when you're actually doing the test. You just don't have the time. The point today is to see what a full analysis would look like. But this is the kind of reading, this kind of attention to detail is what can help you figure out what's going on with these passages and then ultimately answer the questions. So let me know if you have any specific questions on any of the actual PSAT questions that came up. Otherwise, I'll talk to you soon. To learn more about Reason Prep's SAT, SAT subject test, and ACT video courses, go to reasonprep.com enroll, and you can find the link in the description below the video.